I remember when we first introduced creatine through a company called EAS called Betagym back in 1992. And back then, creatine was primarily seen as something that worked along the lines of the Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle, ATP cycle, however you want to basically term it. But since then, the research into creatine, after the bias has been removed, has matured quite significantly. In fact, creatine actually has other avenues of action. In this case, we're looking at sarcopenia in regard to muscle uh, that surprised even I. For example, creatine has been shown to inhibit something called myostatin. For those not familiar, inhibiting myostatin is a good thing when it comes to the anabolic process. Also, too, at least in animal models, creatine has been shown to increase cell volume, which has been shown to help, I would say, start the anabolic process. So really kind of cool. What we're going to look at in the beginning is some of the usages and dosages in regard to creatine. And then although this research is primarily in reference to sarcopenia, liver disease, uh, kidney, you have to keep in mind that this is basically a perspective. Pilot, I don't want to say you need a pilot study, uh, basically for future exploration. What they're doing here is to take in tidbits of other studies and going, hey, this may pertain to be of some benefit in the future, where the future studies are done, in regard to chronic liver disease or adds kidney disease and so on and so forth. So it is a perspective in reference to the current research that's been done, leading to basically avenues of future research. Wordy? Yeah, I know. So let us begin with it as follows. Again, it's quite interesting, and I hope you stick with it because a lot of new things in regard to creatine have come forth since basically when I basically first was introduced to it back in 1992. So let us begin as follows. Creatine supplementation to improve sarcopenia and chronic liver disease, facts, and perspectives. Although creatine supplementation and chronic liver disease seems to be barely investigated and not studied in human patients, its potential efficacy on chronic liver disease is indirectly highlighted in animal models of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease bringing beneficial effects in the fatty liver. What do you see the effect it has on triglycerides and extremely low density lipoproteins? To proceed. Similarly, encephalopathy, encephalopathy and fatigue seem to have beneficial effects. Creatine supplementation and demonstrated effects in sarcopenia and the elderly with and without resistance training suggesting potential role in improving this condition in patients with advanced chronic liver disease. Emphasize the word potential. Creatine supplementation could address several critical points of chronic liver disease and its complications. Further studies are needed to support the clinical burden of this hypothesis. Again, focus on the words themselves. In this review article, quoting, we aim to summarize the current evidence for creatine supplementation in advanced chronic liver disease and primarily in sarcopenic cirrhotic patients who would potentially benefit from creatine supplementation. I would love to cover the entire research article, but all I can do due to time constraints is pull out some of the highlights and leave it for you to follow the trail and investigate on your own. To proceed, dosage formulation and method administration. Here we go. The most commonly recommended dose of creatine supplementation range between three to five grams a day or 0.1 grams a kilogram a day with a common use in athletes of five grams a day. Although it can reach 20 to 25 grams a day or 0.3 grams per kilogram a day in the loading phase. So it gets kind of interesting. To date, the current evidence has demonstrated how a loading phase is not necessary since a lower dosage of creatine, three to five grams a day, can increase intramuscular creatine stores, leading to the beneficial effects on muscles and performance seen with a higher dosage, especially if the supplementation period is over 30 days. Real important for those individuals, for example, with sensitive digestion. To proceed, notably, it is suggested to split creatine dosage into smaller dosages, usually 5 grams four times a day, if loading, throughout the day. The reason behind the fractionation of the dosage are several and mainly related to the major solubility of creatine monohydrate and less risk of gastrointestinal distress. Because the amphalytic property, creatine shows the best solubility, if you're going to use do this much, 14 grams a liter and 20 degrees centigrade with a neutral pH of 7. For this reason, 
Mix it in high temperature solution increases the solubility, although it does not influence tissue uptake. In a healthy subject, correct creatine supplementation induces the saturation of muscular storage in about 28 days. To reiterate, return to the basal status occurs at about four to six weeks, kind of like, you know, unloading. After the discontinuation, the preferential way of administration of creatine is with food, especially when it's a carbohydrate meal because creatine transport into the blood circulation in muscles is facilitated by insulin action. This depends on the insulin capacity it facilitates sodium-dependent creatine transport. For what concerned formulation, monohydrate creatine powder, available tablets or capsules, not an ad, has been the most studied and chosen form of creatine because of its evidence-based efficacy. Over the years, other creatine formulations have come out on the global market fo focusing on better solubility than the monohydrate form. However, published papers have yet to show any major effectiveness of the published, big word, published is peer-reviewed, effectiveness of those other forms compared to the monohydrate. Monohydrates have the best price effectiveness ratio and currently, according to the researchers, the best. If you see a published study in regard to another form, uh, feel free to link. But however, though, again, keep in mind the study or the reference points here in regard to creatine monohydrate. So we want to stick with the parameters of the hypothesis in regard to the researchers, which are focusing on monohydrate. Doesn't mean other ones may not be as good, but the research here focuses on monohydrate. Side effects. The only directly demonstrated side effect of creatine supplementation is weight gain due to the increase in total intracellular body water without altering fluid distribution. Hope you get what I mean by that. But that intracellular water has potentially an anabolic effect. We'll allude to that in a few seconds. To proceed, the general conclusion on the safety of creatine supplementation in health is that there is no clear evidence to affirm that creatine supplementation may affect kidney and liver function in healthy subjects. And in any case, the major risk of creatine supplementation is probably linked to the purity of commercially available forms of creatine. That's why I really want to emphasis good quality, clean creatine without any of the other particulates, which you can research on your own, but you'll see there are potential other contaminants. Pure creatine, monohydrate. Strength. Now, again, this is going to be old school for a lot of individuals, but it gives you an example of how far we matured in regard to the research in regard to creatine. Creatine supplementation has been broadly studied in athletes or people who underwent physical training or sport and widely demonstrated, demonstrating to improve muscle mass, strength, and performance in over 1,000 studies on young and middle-aged subjects. Even in elderly patients, a recent systematic review and meta-analysis have concluded that creatine is a safe supplement associated with resistance training to increase muscular mass. Moreover, in those aged people who do not perform physical training, creatine supplementation can improve quality of life by delaying muscular atrophy and improving endurance and strength, allowing it to preserve muscular performance for everyday tasks. And that may have to do with the myostatin suppression. Again, that's adding a little publisher bias, but it, the Researchers here will allude to that as well, and it kind of makes sense. But correlations on the soy causation, so for future studies. Creatine as a new treatment for improving health and quality of life in patients with chronic kidney disease. CKD is a condition that can reduce muscle mass and neurological function associated with poor quality of life. A recent review supports that creatine supplementation can improve chronic kidney disease patients, muscular, bone, metabolic, immune, central, and peripheral nervous syst uh, systems. And I want to iterate, I know it sounds seductive, but always work with your health professional. To proceed, authors showed wide, wide and convincing evidence to ensure that the safety of creatine supplementation, even in chronic kidney disease patients with a lower serum concentration than healthy controls, proving an impaired creatine synthesis metabolism. In those patients whom creatine was administered, you ready for this? A single effect of reduced muscle cramps and increased quality of life was shown. Real important. Finally, 
An intradialetic infusion of creatine has been demonstrated to bypass ingestion and compliance limits in CKD patients. Work with a healthcare professional, but why? Wow, you talk about matured research, you know, 20, 30 years ago, they wouldn't have touched that now. It's gone, hmm, look at that. All right, other conditions. Creatine has also demonstrated a role in other diseases such as diabetes, osteoporosis, cancer, and cardiovascular and neurological diseases. In addition to the aforementioned beneficial effects of creatine, a series of interesting direct and indirect cellular effects have also been demonstrated, such as protection of tissues from ischemic and oxidative insults. The reduction of inflammatory markers, something new. The anti-apatotic, uh, anti-diabetic, lipid-lowering role in modulator of the immune and intestinal system. Wait till you get to the lipid-lowering part in a few seconds. Finally, a series of studies showed how creatine supplementation can improve beyond the intuitive physical fatigue, the cognitive one in humans, and be beneficial for brain performance. For those that have been following this channel for a while, I think what we did about seven years ago uh, was showing that creatine, one of the studies, helped elevate mood in females to proceed. Now we get into the chronic liver diseases. Again, healthcare professional, always work with. But this is, again, perspective to further hypothesis and other research to proceed. In humans, a study performed on 34 subjects showed how creatine monohydrate supplementation for 56 days, a 20 gram a day for five days, and then five grams a day for 51 days, might significantly reduce blood lipids at four and eight weeks. Significant reductions in total plasma cholesterol by 6% and 5% respectively. Ready for this? Triglycerols and very low density lipid protein by 23 and 22% respectively. Creatine did that. 23 and 22% respectively. Who would have thought? To proceed, creatine and hyperammonemia, ammonemia, in advanced chronic liver disease. Studies have shown that creatine supplementation could supply brain energy, leading to neuroprotective effects against hyperammonemia and induced encephalopathy. Curiously, the lack of brain energy caused by hyperammonemia seems to be able to increase creatine uptake in the brain and endothelial cells. So it's kind of like, for example, as, that, as the high levels of ammonia go up, and interesting enough, the brain, for some unusual reason, wants to have increased its creatine uptake. So it's kind of like a calling card. Third, now we're going to be taking a few tidbits here because we can't cover the whole thing, but to proceed. Clinical data widely demonstrated how creatine, even the elderly population associated with a resistance training, can improve performance in muscular mass. Lastly, creatine is involved in different molecular pathways, particularly in inhibiting myostatin, a myokin that is well known to limit muscular development. Creatine is osmotically an active substance known as a retention substance, driving water intracellularly, particularly in muscular cells where is present 95% of body creatine. Although creatine supplementation increases total body water, this is the kicker, fluid distribution is not altered. Interestingly, an increase in cell volume appears to be an anabolic proliferative signal, which is supposed to be the first step, at least for muscular mice, in mouse protein muscular synthesis. That I found quite intriguing. Again, Everyone thinks about creatine along just basically the ATP pathway, but however, though, it appears to have much more uh, life to it than just that. Creatine supplementation would help to balance the loss of production in liver disease, leading to an optimal, because again, 50% of they believe that the creatine normally produced is in the liver. So people with liver disease may have compromised creatine production. And so this is what the authors are alluding to. And I'm going to start from the beginning once again on this. Creatine supplementation would help to balance the loss of production in liver disease, leading to an optimal concentration of muscle and improving sarcopenia by the series of mechanisms seen. Therefore, it could have a neurologically protective role against hyperammonemia and improve physical and cognitive fatigue. To the conclusion, moreover, fatigue, physical and cognitive, a debilitating symptom in patients affected by chronic kidney disease, chronic diseases could benefit from creatine supplementation. Not only creatine has a property of intracellular driving water, particularly in muscular cells, a long shot, it can be hypothesized a role of creatine in helping to prevent fluid decomposition, decompensation. Lastly, but principally, the most interesting and surely promising aspect is the role of creatine supplementation on sarcopenia to prevent and treat this important condition, 
associated with poor outcomes and prognosis, such as it already occurs for the elderly subjects who is administered with creatine or subject. Ideally, creatine supplementation in patients with chronic liver disease could act on several critical points of this condition and comp its complications. Further studies are needed, and I want to reemphasize, this is a perspective that the research is looking at current research that's been done, taking that research, and then producing a vector for future research. Further study needs to support the clinical burden of this hypothesis in chronic liver disease. And with that conclusion, you have to look at those individuals that have known creatine has been on the market for quite some time. And the controversy when it was first introduced to the market, wow. Once those biases were removed and further research was done, first to validate its effect, then from there to explore additional venues of potential uses as a prophylactic for other conditions. Wow, look how the whole world began to open up into potential. And I want to keep on reiterating the word potential until the studies are done, because correlation is not causation, but the great potential of helping many individuals, especially in an aging population where muscle strength, mobility, and overall freedom, cognitively and physically, can be maintained healthfully into the later years. But that will conclude. Again, gratitude to the researchers. As always, I am humbled if you watch this long to the end here. I am very, very humbled. Long video, great research, great exploration. Links will be there. And as always, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'll catch you all next week. See you next time. Bye.